I'm E.G. Marshall, and I want very much to tell you the story of a young lady named Barbara. Everyone is more or less mad on one point, said Rudyard Kipling, the famous English writer. And I'm inclined to agree with him, since I myself am more or less mad on the point of mystery. But our sweet heroine's madness took a strange turn, as we shall soon discover in the unfolding of the tale entitled, All Living Things Must Die. Our mystery drama... All Living Things Must Die was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Great taste in the morning. Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. You know, for years we've been talking about the Special K breakfast, a great way to start the day if you have a weight problem. You may have seen or heard our latest commercials, which symbolize the problem of being a few pounds overweight by using this ball and chain. That's the sound effect. But so many people have come to know the Special K breakfast that can help solve weight problems, they sometimes forget that Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It has eight essential vitamins and iron, and so delicious that lots of folks, kids as well as adults, eat Special K just for the sheer good taste of it. So we don't want you to think that you have to wear a ball and chain to eat Special K. All you need is an appreciation for the finer things of life, a one-ounce bowl of Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, coffee, and maybe a little sugar. The Special K breakfast can help you lose weight all by itself. But it really is a good start. No matter what you say before, that's what suburban say before suburban. Suburban Savings offers you an easy way to borrow without touching a penny in your regular savings passbook account. Just let Suburban loan you the money. It's called Suburban Savings Passbook Loan. You can borrow up to 90% of the total amount you have on deposit at reasonable rates, and you can pay off your loan at your convenience. When your loan is repaid, you still have all of your savings intact, plus interest. So if you need money, why not take a loan from Suburban without touching your savings? Suburban Savings Passbook Loan in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Now begins our story of the lightly demented Barbara, a lovely lady of 31 or 2, even 4 or 5. But as we now discover her in the living room of her suburban home, she could be younger than springtime. She could be spring itself. I love you. I love you all. You are my darlings. My pets. My very own treasures. Oh, how beautiful you are. And how much I love you. What? Well, that can't be Frank. He never forgets his key. Oh, oh, it's... Johnson, ma'am. Detective Sergeant Johnson from the other day. Oh, yes. Come in. I didn't realize you'd be back. Well, I was just checking up. Have any more of those uh, obscene phone calls? No, not one. And it's such a relief, you can't imagine. Mm -hmm. You had your number changed. Yes, yes, and and, and that seems to have done the trick all right. Oh, good, good. Now, a lady like you shouldn't be bothered by things like that. Well, there's one other thing I hate to mention it. No, no, go ahead. Mention anything you want to. We're here to serve. Well, it could be my imagination, but every once in a while, I see a man sort of hanging around across the street, not doing anything in particular, but just hanging around. Mm -hmm. Any uh, special time of day? Yes, usually about this time. I see him through this window when I'm putting my plants to bed. Oh, you tuck them in, do you? Well, sort of. I talk to them, and sometimes I sing them a lullaby. (laughs) I know that sounds silly, but, well, that's what I do. And then sometimes through the window, 
I think I see this man. Well, it's kind of hard to see out this window, ma'am. The plants ought to get in the way. Yes, I know they do, but they like it here. I tried other places, but they weren't happy, so... They are happy here, huh? Well, they haven't complained. Although I'm not sure about Annabelle. Uh, this one is Annabelle. That's Arthur. And that's Kenneth. Mm -hmm. And this is Marianne. <laughs> and that spider plant over there is Michael. Oh, Michael's in great shape, isn't he? Oh, yes, he is. He's... Are you laughing at me? Please don't. Do I look like I'm laughing? My husband laughs at me sometimes. I wouldn't know why. Oh, because... Now, you see this one, Marianne? Mm -hmm. Will you take a close look because you won't see a Marianne every day in the week. Well, Marianne is, uh... Well, she, she looks like ivy to me. Yes, but her leaves... Her leaves are heart-shaped. Can't you see? Each one is shaped like a perfect little heart. Uh, you know, you're right. Yes. There are more than 200 varieties of ivy. Did you know that? No, no, I never did. Hey, what's going on here? Oh, Frank. This is my husband. Frank, this is Detective Sergeant Johnson. Ed Johnson. How are you? Pleased to meet you, Mr. Murray. He came to check up on those phone calls. Oh, yeah, from the uh, degenerate. I told Barbara she should answer him back in his own language. Oh, Frank, please. Let him have it. Give it to him right between the eyes. The ears, I should say, in this instance. Well, I'll, uh, I'll be getting along. Well, I'll show you to the door. Say, listen, why can't you catch those freaks? Oh, thank you for coming around, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, stop by again if it's all right with you. Oh, any time, practically. I'm almost always here. And uh, take good care of Annabelle. Oh, I will. And don't let Michael grow too fast. <laughs> I'll do my best. Good night, Mrs. Murray. Good night, Sergeant Johnson. And thank you. Now, don't you mention it. What was all that about? Well, I told you. The phone call. I mean, all that whispering. All that bzz, bzz, bzz at the door just now. Oh, we weren't whispering. Well, what were you talking about? That I wasn't supposed to hear? Nothing. He just said, I don't know, something about the plants. That's all. What does he know about plants? Well, nothing much. When he was here the first time, and just now before you came in, I told him about them. He knows that I talk to them and that they have names. He was just being friendly, Frank. That's being friendly? Dropping in all the time when I'm not here? Only twice. This was only the second time. Oh, he's a kook like you. Freaked out over a bunch of plants. Well, he was only expressing an interest. What's interesting about a bunch of plants with no flowers? Look at them. They take up the whole window. You got them strung all over the place, up to the ceiling, hanging down. They're vines, Frank. They're silver lace and philodendron and ivy. Oh, whatever they are, they're dumb. Plain dumb. I wouldn't object to a nice pot of tulips, something like that, sitting on a table. Like a nice spot of color or a higher scent. They smell good. But uh, these things... Don't, don't, don't hurt them, don't. I got no use for them at all. Oh, Get rid of them, why no, not you? No, no, never. You can't make me. Oh, boy, you sure cry easy. What did I say was so terrible? You said get rid of them. Well, all right, all right. Forget I mentioned it. What's for dinner? It's Swiss steak. Again? Well, it's been a whole week. Well, I'll get it on the table, because i got to get out of here early. You mean you're going out? i got a date to go bowling. Tonight? Well, certainly tonight. What do you think, next year? But you were out last night and the night before. And I may go out tomorrow night, the night after that. So what? Frank, Frank, I get so lonely. Well, read a book. Watch TV, listen to the radio. But almost every night and all day. Well, all right, talk to your plants. That's what you got them for, is it? Have a nice little conversation with Michael and uh, Mary Louise and uh, Archibald, whatever you call them. Never mind. Just never mind. Well, look, I'm going to take a quick shower and then we'll eat. Ten minutes on the outside, okay? Okay. Oh, Arthur... Annabelle, tell me that you love me. Mary Ann, do you love me? Michael, Kenneth, oh, somebody love me. Please, somebody love me or I'll die. Hey. That Swiss steak wasn't bad at all. Thank you. Got any dessert? Just fruit. 
Now, take an apple with me. Frank, don't go for a minute. Well, I told you, I got a date. No, I want to talk to you about something. I'll go ahead, but keep it short, will you? Oh, well, Frank, remember when we got married? Well, how could I forget with you to remind me? Well, you said then that you didn't want to have any children right away. I don't believe in rushing into things like that. Frank, that was ten years ago. Yeah, I know. But, but isn't it different now? Well, not necessarily. I mean, uh, I think I'm too old for kids. Oh, you're only 45. And by the time my kid grew up, I'd be an old man. No, not really old. Well, aren't you kind of old to be having a kid for the first time? Frank, lots of women have children at my age. Lots of them. I don't know if it's safe. Yes, it is. It, it happens all the time, and I'm very healthy. I'm very strong. You don't look too strong. Well, I am, because the doctor said so. When did you go to see a doctor? Last week. I don't like you doing that without asking me first. Well, I wanted to be sure before I talked to you. And the doctor says it would be perfectly all right for me to have a baby. As a matter of fact, he said it would be the best thing in the world for me. Well, I can't say it. On account of the loneliness, Frank, I don't think you realize how lonely I get. That's why I talk to the plants and sing to them. Because I haven't got anybody else. Well, make some friends, why don't you? That's not easy for me. Well, why not? I do it all the time. Anyway, it's not the same as having somebody... Right here in the house with me all the time. It's not the same intimate kind of thing. If I had a baby... Oh, Frank, I wouldn't ask for anything else ever. And I'd give that baby so much love and attention. It would grow up to be the most marvelous person because it would know from the very beginning that it was loved and wanted. Oh, so much wanted. Well, I don't want it. You got that? A kid is the last thing in the world I want. Please. No, no, no. I live in this house, too, you know. I don't want a kid running around, messing up everything, making a lot of noise, getting in the way all the time. No, it wouldn't be like that. Oh, yes, it would. No. No, I won't have a kid messing up my life, and that's final, so forget it, huh? Huh? You hear me? Forget it. Put it out of your mind. Okay? Huh? Well, I gotta get going. The guys are waiting for me at the boat again. Frank. All right, now what? No, no, I won't keep you a minute. I haven't got a minute. Oh, please, less than a minute. Well, okay, spill it. When I was at the supermarket this morning, there was this dog. A dog, oh boy. Really, a very pretty dog, and so sweet. And he was just wandering around. Nobody knew who he belonged to, or if he belonged to anybody. He's just a stray, as far as anybody knows. No dog. And he has this cute little tail that curls up right over his back, and, and great ears that stand up straight and then flop over. And he's mostly black with a kind of white face. Barbara, we've been through all this. I will not have a dog in my house. Now, that is how it is, and I don't want to talk about it now or never. You understand that? Yes. I gotta go. Frank? I said I gotta go. Just one more thing. There's this man hanging around outside. What man? Hanging around where? I was telling Detective Johnson about it. This man sort of hangs around across the street. And I thought, if he's a, a, a prowler or a dangerous kind of person, well, a dog would be protection for me, see, when I'm alone. What makes you think this guy is dangerous? I don't know that he is, but every night now when I'm watering the plants just before you come home, I can see him through the window just sort of standing there and looking around. This window? Yes. He looks kind of shifty, Frank. And if I had a dog, I'd feel safe. I can't see it. Yes, right across the street. I can't see on account of these dumb plants. Don't, don't hurt them. Why do they have to grow them so damn well, long? Just, just part them very carefully. Here, let me... Oh, no, I can do it. I can do it. There. Can you see that man? I see him. Bobby, you're a nut, you know that? Why am I? That's the guard they hired at the high-rise. They pay him to watch the building. Of course he's here every night. That's what he's paid for. I didn't know that. Are you trying to con me into letting you have a dog for protection? Well, it won't work, Barbara. The answer's still the same. No dog, no baby. Just be happy with these dumb plants. They're bad enough. Taking up the whole bloody window, spilling all over the place. I hate you. You're lucky I let you keep them. I hate you. I wish you were dead. What did you say? I said, I hate you. I wish you were dead. Did you really say... 
Hey. Hey, what? Hey, what? <gasps> What's this? The bloody plants are on my neck. Oh. Hey, hey, Barbara, they're all around me. Mm. They're choking me. I can't get them off. Hey, Barbara. Barbara, they're too strong. Bart. Bart, 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 Barbara, don't stand there. Get them off. No. Get the scissors. Barbara, the scissors. I hate you. I hate you. I want you dead. <laughs> return shortly for the second act of All Living Things Must Die. Hi, I'm Goldilocks, Ms. Goldilocks, if you please, and I'm a professional taste tester. Here at my taste test laboratory, that's TTL for short, <laughs> I taste test everything from porridge to diet drinks. Actually, there's not that much taste testing in porridge these days. There used to be once upon a time. I mean, that's how this Miz got into the biz. <laughs> but lately, it's been diet drinks. I mean, with so many diet drinks going sugar-free, I've been really busy conducting taste tests. A rather unbearable assignment, to be sure. But then I discovered sugar-free diet 7-Up. Fresh, natural, delicious. My only problem is that sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that it broke my Goldilocks diet drink taste meter well, Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up certainly has my seal of approval. This one's just right. Hey, Mom, what's for dinner? Hey, Mom, what you got? It's time to get ready for the great outdoors. And your ShopRite supermarket has everything you'll need for cookout dinners and fun in the sun. And for this week's dinners, ShopRite is featuring whole grade-A frying chickens, just 37 cents a pound. Roasting chickens up to 4 pounds, 47 cents a pound. Choice rib steaks, one nineteen a pound. ShopRite franks, 89 cents a pound. Get all your outdoor cooking equipment and many great food values at your ShopRite supermarket. She loves the family. She wants the best Macy's store-wide spring sale blossoms all this week with beautiful values in every department, every Macy's store. Values like a 40-piece Nyko Ironstone service rate, regularly $55, now just $39.99. And hand-cut lead crystal selection of hostess items, regularly $15 to $25, now $9.99 to $14.99. Save in every department all this week. Macy's store-wide spring sale. This is WOR New York and RKO General Station. Now for the second act of All Living Things Must Die. It is a year later, and our heroine no longer lives in the little suburban house, nor is her name Barbara Murray. She lives in a cheery little two-room apartment, and she is married to Detective Sergeant Ed Johnson. But Kenneth and Arthur and Mary Ann and Michael and Annabelle, all the plants are grouped together in the largest window, and all appear to be in the best of health. Baby boats a silver moon sailing on the sea. Baby. Oh, he's home. Eh? Hello, sweetheart. Hello, darling. Hey, 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 watch out. What, what, what have you got there? Oh, just a little addition to the family. <laughs> what? What is well, it? Well, let me get the paper off, will you? <laughs> okay. There you are. Oh. How's that, huh? Eh. Mm. Oh, it's. Beautiful. You know what it's called? Yes, do you? Sure, a purple passion plant. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh. I thought it was very appropriate for two people oh. who've been married a month. Oh, it is, it is, Ed. It's beautiful. And you were so sweet to think of it. Well, there's uh, something else I've been thinking of. What's that? Honey, is it too soon for us to be thinking about having a baby? A baby? Well, you do want us to have a baby, don't you, Barbara? Well, I guess so. I brought the subject up too soon. I can see that dumb me. I'm sorry. No, that's right. No, no, no. I was stupid. Forget I'd mentioned it, huh? Only, it doesn't do any harm to think about it a little, does it? No. I guess it doesn't do any harm to think about it. Oh, Cleopatra. You're growing very nicely, dear. 
It would take a little while before you'll be as long as Annabelle. And you'll probably never be as long as Michael. But then very few plants are. But you're so healthy and strong. And I love your purple leaves. You're very beautiful, my darling. Yes, you are. He's home. Darling? Darling, you're home. Yep, I'm home. Hey, look what I brought with me. Why, why? Oh, no, it's a dog. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, isn't he darling? Yeah, yeah. He, he wandered into the station house oh. about a week ago. We've been feeding him, and he's been sleeping look, there. Look, look, look. His tail curls up over his back. Yeah, he's got a great disposition. Oh, my. Doesn't he belong to anybody? Well, we advertised in the paper three days running. Nobody answered the yet. You mean he's got no home? Nobody wants him? Well, not unless you do. You mean I can have him? He can live here with us. Well, would you like oh, that? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, right. Dog, I guess you got a oh, home. Oh, <laughs> I love him. Dog, you got yourself a mother. Look, look, look at him. Look how he's looking at yeah, you. Yeah. Come here, come here, dog. <laughs> come here. Oh, he loves you. You can see it in his eyes. He just loves you. Well, I'm his father, aren't I? <laughs> Hey, dog, do you love your father? Of course he loves you. How could he help but love you? How could anybody help but love you? Well, there's only one person has to love me. That's you. Uh But you have to, baby. It's absolutely necessary. It's essential that you love me because if you don't, it's the end of me. Oh, Ed, I love you so much. I can't even talk about it. Just believe me. I love you and I love you and I love you. When you're here and when you're not here and when you're asleep and when you're awake and when you talk and when you don't talk and when you look at me and when you don't, I love you all the time. That's a lot of love. I've got more. More? Anytime you need it. Barbara. Honey. Hmm? Look, we've been married better than half a year now. When are we going to start having a baby? Oh. I don't know. Pretty soon? Mm, I guess. You want one, don't you, honey? Yes. Well, when do we? Well, sometimes. Well, sweetheart, we're not kids anymore. I know that. I... You think I'm putting the pressure on you? No, I shouldn't do that. I didn't mean to. No, that's all right. No, I won't do that anymore. You, you, you just got to tell me when you think is the right time. I won't bother about it anymore. Oh, Ed, I... Now, what are we going to name the dog? <laughs> I don't know. How about uh, Cuthbert or, or uh, Lance? Oh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Herman? Dwight? No, 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 I don't want to give him any name like that. I want to call him what you called him. Me? I never called him Yes, anything. you did. You called him Dog. <laughs> That's what I want to call him. D-A-W-G? <laughs> dog? Yes, come here, Dog. Hey. Oh, <laughs> what a lovely dog you are, Dog. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel marvelous. Well, you look marvelous. How's the family? Well, I've been giving Annabelle a little too much water, but everybody else is fine. Oh, I brought you a present. A first anniversary present. Well, I have one for you, too. Here. That's, oh. uh, that's an engagement ring. You, you never had one. Oh, Ed, this is lovely. Do you like it? Oh, yes, I love it. <sighs> Almost as much as I love you and dog. And Annabelle and <laughs> Hey, 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 watch it. <laughs> and I got you a ring, too. A what? Yes, a wedding ring, because you never have one. Oh, hey, hey, yeah. that, that's nice. <laughs> that's real nice. Is it okay for a man to wear this? Well, it just shows everybody that you're married. Well, everybody knows I'm married. Does everybody really know you're married? Well, I talk about it all the time. Well, do you sure? really? Do you sure. talk about it? Well, I, I'm married to you, so naturally it's you I talk <laughs> about. I bet you bore everybody to tears. Yeah, I bet I do. <laughs> of course, they're, they're uh, always... Comes a time when they break in and say, any kids? You got any kids? Yes, I suppose they do say that. And, of course, I say no, and they say, well, why not? And I don't know what to say. Ed, I'm so sorry. Honey, why not? You have to tell me. Well, it's a, a, a feeling that I have. Well, don't you want to, baby? I always thought you were the kind of woman who'd want a family. It's hard to explain. Well, you've got to try. Okay. Okay, I'll try Only, Ed, I don't think you're going to like what I'm going to tell you. Anything. I want to hear anything you have to tell me. Well, I have to go back to the night that Frank died. Frank? Yeah. What's Frank got to do with it? I'm going to tell you if you listen. Yeah, I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, you remember when I called you that night and I told you that Frank was dead? You remember that? Yeah, sure. Of course I remember. And, And you came over with the others and you asked me how it happened. Yeah. And I said I didn't know. I said that Frank was going to go out bowling and he must have been in a hurry and the room was dark and he must have stumbled into the plants and 
got tangled up in them and he couldn't get out. Yeah, but he was strangled by the plants, baby. It was a freak accident. No, that isn't what happened at all. Honey, are you trying to tell me... I don't know, are you trying to tell me that you pushed him or something, that you wrapped the plants around his neck? I didn't. All right, now, wait a minute. Maybe you better tell it to me from the beginning. Well, you remember Frank came home that day while you were still here. Uh-huh. And then you left. And he told me to hurry up with dinner because he was going out. And I got upset. I told him I'd get so lonely here. Lonely every night. Almost every day. Read a book. Watch TV. Listen to the radio. Talk to your plants. That's what you got them for, isn't it? So after dinner, I said I wanted to talk to him about having a baby. A kid is the last thing in the world I want. And I think maybe it was then that I got the idea. What idea? It just seemed awfully important to me to get Frank over by the window where the plants were hanging. So I told him that there'd been a man hanging around outside across the street. What man? Hanging around where? And he started walking toward the window. And I started feeling this... this awful, wild excitement. The nearer he got to the window, the nearer he got to the plants. And then I said it. Said what, honey? I hate you. I said, I hate you. At first, Frank didn't hear me. Or maybe he didn't believe his ears, but I said it again. I hate you. And then I said, I wish you were dead. He heard me say that. Then what happened? He started to look angry. And he made a little move toward me. And it was then, when he started to move, that the plants moved. They moved. Faster than anyone would think plants could move. And they wound themselves around his neck. Around and around and tighter and tighter. And Frank began to choke. Barbara, they're all around my neck. They're choking me. Oh, no. I can't get them off. Don't stand, Nick. Eh? Get them off. Get the scissors. No. Barbara, the scissors. Because there were scissors there, you know, on the windowsill. And Frank couldn't reach them because the plants were holding him so tight. And tighter all the time. And I knew the scissors were there. I kept them there all the time, just the way I do now, to cut off the dead leaves and things. But I didn't move. I just stood there, repeating those awful words. I hate you. I hate you. I wish you were dead. Barbara! Barbara! I watched his face turn purple, and then blue. And then he dropped to the floor. And I watched him drop. And I looked at him. But all I said was... Dead. I listened to the plants for a while. They seemed to be telling me, See how we love you. See, we'll do anything you ask. We are your true loves. We've killed for you. Now you know how much we love you. And then I went to the phone and called you. Darling, you had a bad dream, that's all. No. No, it wasn't a dream. I made the plants do what they did, don't you see? I said I wanted Frank dead, and they hurt me. Or they felt what I was feeling, or they sensed it, or something. And because they love me, and because they know that I'd never kill anybody, they went ahead and did it for me. Sweetheart, even if what you say is true, if it could be true, you never laid a finger on Frank. But I'm an accessory, don't you see? I wanted someone to kill Frank. Not me, but someone. And the plants knew it. And they killed him for me. Do you think anybody's going to believe you, sweetheart? Yes. Do you believe me? Honey, is this why you don't want to have a baby? Oh, I want to, but... But what? That's how it all started. Me asking Frank if I could have a baby. Well, why don't you try asking me? You know what kind of an answer you'll get, don't you? Go ahead. Ask me. Ed? Is it all right? Is it? Hello. Uh, This is Mrs. Ed Johnson. Yes. Well, uh, I saw the doctor a couple of days ago, and uh, he was going to have a test made to see if I... Oh, you can tell me. It is really... Really? Yes, I believe you. Thank you very much. 
It's true. It's really true, dog. Michael, Marianne, I'm going to have a baby. Annabelle, it's true. Kenneth, Cleopatra, Arthur, finally, I'm going to have a baby. What do you think about that? Are you pleased? Are you happy? Tell me what you think because you're very important to me. Yes, you're my best friend. I'm not young anymore. And there are people who think I'm, well, strange. I'm too emotional, that's what they think. And they may be right. How do I know? So please, tell me, because I trust you. <laughs> Is it all right for me to have a baby? You really think so? Ed! Ed, it's true! I just called the doctor's office and they told me it's true. I'm going to have a baby, Ed. Tell me. Tell me. Is it really all right? We'll be back shortly with Act Three. When you say Budweiser. When you say Bud, you've said a lot of things nobody else can say. When you say Bud, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you say Bud, you tell the world you know what makes it all the way. When you say Bud, you say you care enough to only want the king of beers. There is no other no one. Other one. Anheuser Busch, St. Louis. Macy's storewide spring sale blossoms all this week with beautiful values in every department, every Macy store. Values like all wool pile Oriental design rugs, regularly two hundred dollars, now just one hundred fifty. Save in the rug department on worsted wool, imported woven saruk, and kerman designs. Save in every department all this week. Macy's storewide spring sale. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad for things that make a happy day? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you found the love to grow and stay? Aren't you glad that we're pulling together? Aren't you glad that we're feeling free? Aren't you glad? 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 Aren't you glad just to be? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad for feeling cool and clean all day? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you've done your best to stay that way? Aren't you glad? Glad we're getting together. Aren't you glad that the people smile? Aren't you glad? You use style. Aren't you glad? You use style. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? You use style. We're still in the little two-room apartment, and the plants still hang in the window, but everything else is different, for it is precisely eight months since we last heard her voice. There! They're gone. Ed, they're gone. What's that, Hermie? The movers have gone. They took the last chair out just now. Oh, oh I hope they don't break anything. Oh, sweetie, they won't. Don't worry about oh, it. Oh, I don't worry about anything anymore. Do you mean that? Sometimes I try to worry, because after all, I used to worry all the time. I mean, I worried all my life, but now I can't worry. I've forgotten how it's being pregnant. Well, maybe I ought to try it. Oh, I'm so sorry for you, you know that. How come? Being a man, you can't ever be happy the way I'm happy. I've got my own way. I feel so complete, so... So fulfilled. I guess so. As though there'd been something missing from the day I was born. And now I've got it. I was so, so unfinished before, but now... I'm, well, I'm complete. Just you wait till we get settled in the new apartment, baby. Wait till we get the little baby's room decorated and the crib moved in and all that other stuff. <laughs> Shouldn't we go over there now? Well, I suppose we ought to give the movers time to get there. No, I want to go now. I can't wait. Yeah, neither can I. Oh, honey. Isn't it wonderful how we always seem to feel the same oh, way? Oh, honey, you never have that other feeling anymore, do you? What feeling? You know, about... 
How Frank died. The plants. Oh, that. You don't ever feel that maybe you shouldn't have a baby. Oh, no. Well, you know, when you first found out, you weren't too sure. Oh, but that was eight months ago. That was before I started feeling the baby grow. Before I knew that it was going to be my baby. My child. And then I knew that if there ever was anything that was right, having this baby was that thing. And Frank, you ever think about him, about that night? I'm not sure it ever happened. I mean, I'm not sure it happened the way I said. I think probably you were right. I dreamed the whole thing. It was an accident, Barbara. Frank and the plants. It was a freak accident. I guess so. Now, come on. Let's go over to the new apartment. Mm. Movers ought to be almost there. Yeah, okay. I'll take the plants down. Oh, no, 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 no. I want to do that. No, honey, no, no, no. I don't want you doing things like that. Not now. Eight months. Holy cow. Oh, don't be silly. I know just how they're tied up because I did it myself in the first place. Come on, hand me the scissors. They're right there. Baby. Now you cut the strings. I think I ought to. No, no, really. They wouldn't like anybody else touching them. I know what you can do. You can get those cartons we saved to pack them in and all that tissue paper. Go on, you do that. That'd be a big help. Okay, if you say so. Oh, here's the scissors. Right. Only take a minute. Yeah, I'll be right back. Now then, here we go. Now, Cleopatra, let's get you down first. No, Michael, you'll have to wait until last because you're so long and strong. It'd be hard to separate you from the others. Oh! Gee, it's hard to reach. I don't know if I can... Oh, maybe I should have let Ed take you down. My arms hurt. Isn't that funny? I never had any trouble before. Well, of course, it's being pregnant. It's this baby I'm carrying around with me. Are you a boy? Or are you a girl? Or are you twins? I think you're twins. Wouldn't that be heavenly? An old lady like me having twins. A boy and a girl? Oh, I don't care. I don't care about anything anymore, except my husband and my child. I don't even care about the plants. Isn't that strange? For so long, so many years, they were my dearest friends. They were my only friends. And now, they just don't matter anymore. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave them, right here. You don't need them. Got a new place to live. We're going to have a baby. We have each other. We don't need these old plants anymore. They can just stay right here. Ed. Ed. I just decided that we don't... No, don't. Get away. Get away from me. Ed. Ed, it's the plants. They're choking me. Ed, the plants. I got the cart. Oh, bro. Oh, my God. You're joking. Right. This is it. Quick. I can't breathe. All right, I've got him. It's all right. It's going to be all right. Barbara. It's all right. Barbara, it's going to be all right. Barbara, are you all right? What the doctor say? He says I'm all right. I can go home. Did you tell him? How could I tell him? I made up something. I said I got tangled up in the clothesline. That was the first thing that came into my head. Anyhow, he didn't ask me many questions because he could see that I wasn't really hurt. I was just scared. Oh, you sure had me scared. Well, they didn't hurt me much, really, the plants. Well, why should they hurt you at all? You loved those plants. Ed, Ed, Ed. While I was taking them down, it was harder than I thought it would be, and my arms got tired. Well, I told you to let me do it. And, and I stopped for a minute, and then I thought, why am I bothering with these plants? taking them down and carting them to the new place and then putting them up all over again. So I thought, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave them. I'm happy. I've got everything I want. I don't need them. I even think I said that out loud. And they heard me. Now, Barbara. But it wouldn't have made any difference. They didn't have to hear me say it out loud. Because they knew what I was thinking. Honey. No, you see, you can't live that close to somebody for so long and so close without knowing what she's thinking. And they knew that I was going to go off and leave them. After all our years together, I was going to abandon them. I didn't care anymore what happened to them. And they knew that. Oh, no, it's just hard to conceive of plans. They, they, they wouldn't have killed me, Ed. They didn't even really mean to hurt me. They were just saying, don't go. Or if you must go, take us with you. You can see that, can't you? All I know is I came into the room and I saw you with the vines around your throat and you were saying, 
choking me get the scissors. Well, I got those scissors so fast, they were they were right there on the windowsill, and I, I cut those vines so fast. Boy, you had me worried, baby. Oh, you must have fainted by then. Yeah, and I picked you up and put you in the car, and you came too before we got to the hospital. And here I am, and I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. Barbara, you don't uh, suppose I hurt the plants, do you? I just slashed away. Well, I don't suppose you cut them down very carefully. Oh, heck no. Oh, they'll be all right. I'll trim them properly when we get back. You're, uh... Not going to leave him there? You're going to take him to the new apartment? Yes. Yes, I am. I don't know what I was thinking of. How could I just go off and leave the things that I've loved and that have loved me? I can't walk out on them. I forgot that. And they were trying to remind me. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. But then you always are. Well, I'm right about this. Yeah. Well, let's go, huh? Yeah. Oh, poor Cleopatra. Why, poor Cleopatra? Well, I knocked her on the floor. You what? Yeah, when I was trying to cut you loose, I knocked Cleopatra on the floor, broke the pot and everything. You mean she's lying there, the pot is broken, and she's lying there on the floor with no dirt? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, Ed, come on. Now, Barbara. No, hurry up. We've got to get there before she dies. <laughs> Please, let no. me do it. There she is. Let There's me, Cleopatra. Let me do it, honey. You just stay there. Let Look me out, Ed. Up. They're angry. Ed, they're coming for no, you. No, it's all right. Ed, please get out of the way. Stand no, back. Let me do it. You think I'm going to let you do of it? Of course they are. Of course they are. Aren't you, my darling? Aren't you? Ed, hand me that Aiden pot, the one right there. No, 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 no. Your roots haven't been out of the earth for very long, my love. Now, oh, gently. Gently. No, no, I'm not hurting her. See, Michael, I'm being very gentle. I'm putting the good earth in the pot. See, Michael? Ed, get me some water, just a little. Honey, I don't like leaving you Don't be silly, I'll be perfectly all right. Okay, I'll be right back. Now, you see, Michael? I'm scooping up every last bit of the nice brown earth. And I'm sifting it through my fingers. See? See, Annabelle? See, all of you? Oh, very carefully with the beautiful, loose, brown earth. Here you are. Now, we put a little water in. Not very much, because the earth wasn't very dry. Yeah, there's some plant food on the windows. Yeah, I got it. Here you are. Now, we mix just a little of it into the soil. There we are, like that. And now, Cleopatra, my love, let me pick you up. I'll hold you for a second. And don't be frightened, my dear. No, 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 no. And put your little roots into the dirt. Very gently, very carefully. And press the dirt down around them. And then we add the rest of the dirt. Almost to the top. And we press it down. Not too hard, just enough to make you feel safe. There we are. You see, Michael, Marianne, Annabelle, see, she's going to be all right. You think she really will, Bill? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, I'm going to set her here on the windowsill. I let the sun pour all over her. Well, shouldn't you start taking down the other plants? No, no, not yet. They've had an awful shock. Yeah, but honey, the, the furniture movers at the other apartment, they, they must be going crazy wondering where we are. Well, you go. You take the car and go over there. What about you? Come back for me later. Okay. Like uh, in an hour? Well, make it a couple of hours. Okay, baby. Hmm. Baby boats of silver moon Sailing on the sea Yes, my dear ones, rest Rest, my darling. Sail, baby, sail out across the sea. Only don't forget to sail home again to me. Only don't forget to sail. The next time you pass by a plant, stop and look. Make a little bow or tip your hat. And if its leaves flutter and make a sound, listen. 
It may be trying to tell you something. I'll be back shortly. Commuting. We're big on that. Time is money in the business world. That's why Ozark offers commuter flights that get you there and back the same day. Don't ever let a few hundred miles stand between you and big business opportunities. If you're long on work but short on time, let Ozark make your day pay off. Commuting, we're big on that. Get to Champaign-Urbana, Peoria, and Springfield, Illinois. Call Ozark or your travel agent. Macy's store-wide spring sale blossoms all this week with beautiful values in every department, every Macy's store. Values like Lee's Broadloom. Save 2 to $4 a square yard installed over sponge rubber padding. 35 styles, 500 colors. Regularly $12.99 to $21.99 a square yard. Now sale price $9.99 to $17.99. Save in every department all this week. Macy's store-wide spring sale. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Larry Haynes, and Ralph Bell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The W.R. Mystery Theater has been brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Stand by now for a chilling moment from tomorrow night's W.O.R. Mystery Theater drama. You belong to her now, Claude. You belong to Venus. What are you saying? You made a vow to the statue. I was only joking. We were all only joking. Perhaps. But she took it seriously. But it's only a statue. It's the statue that stood in the shrine of the Temple of Venus. It is the Venus herself. But what does she want? She wants you. I didn't mean it. You saw it was all in fun. She wants you, Claude. She wants to love you. And then, as she's done so many times in the past, she'll kill you. Tomorrow night's thriller is called Venus Deal. It features Norman Rose and Joan Lovejoy and will be heard following Fulton Lewis at 7 o'clock right here on WOR Radio, The Talk of New York. Boy, if the old-timer Horatio K. Boomer and Wally Wimple could see me now. <laughs> Fibber McGee, back on the radio right here from 79 Westville Vista with a brand-new program where I'm going to bring back the great old radio shows from way back. Shows like Mr. Keene, Lum and Abner. Well, I guess I ought to get this place straightened up a bit, though. Where's that vacuum? Oh, I left it in the hall closet. Oh, look. Hear the good old days of radio tonight at 9.05, right here on WOR New York and RKO General Station. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Nixon goes before the television cameras and radio microphones tonight to explain to the nation why he will only partially comply with a House Judiciary subpoena for tape recordings of some 42 White House conversations. It is not known just how partial the president's compliance will be. Most bets are that he's going to deliver some of the tapes in their entirety. Others may be edited with discussions which the president feels are not germane to the House Committee's impeachment inquiry excluded. In some other cases, Chairman Peter Rodino's panel may just get written transcripts of the tapes, not the tapes themselves. Knowing that that would not satisfy the Judiciary Committee, Chairman Rodino has said that he will be satisfied with nothing short of complete compliance with the subpoena. President Nixon tonight is likely to strike out at some happy middle ground, or a middle ground that he thinks would be happy, selecting perhaps some mutually acceptable third party who would vouch for the authenticity of the transcripts and who would ensure that any areas which are edited out are, in fact, non-germane. Again, though, that is not likely to satisfy the Judiciary Committee, which has insisted all the way along on getting only the original materials. 
The president, of course, has until 10 a.m. tomorrow to formally comply with a subpoena. It is an unprecedented situation in which a House committee is clearly, clearly treading on what some constitutional attorneys regard as sacred executive territory. The Constitution, remember, establishes three separate but totally equal branches of the federal government. Each has a right to remain aloof from the other. The president, in other words, if he so chose, could probably duck behind the so-called executive privilege and refusing to even partially comply with a House committee subpoena. It would be a contest that would eventually wind up in the federal courts, no doubt the Supreme Court, and technically, even if the Supreme Court were to side with the Congress, the president could just challenge the court to enforce its ruling, knowing full well that the Supreme Court has no enforcement powers. You can be sure, though, that even though these options may have crossed Mr. Nixon's mind at one time or another, they have never been seriously contemplated. There is an element of politics in his present dilemma. An impeachment threat is breathing heavily down his neck. He must be certain on the one hand that in responding to the demands of a panel of the House of Representatives, which has been charged with the initial impeachment inquiry, he does not establish any precedents which would do irreparable damage to the doctrine of separation of powers. The president must be equally certain, on the other hand, that he does not go so far down the road of executive privilege, that he waves a red flag in the face of a potentially bullish Congress, angering it to the point where, for sheer spite, it might remove Mr. Nixon from office. Well, yesterday, a jury in New York acquitted the two men who were at the top of the official totem pole throughout the Watergate scandal. The two men who, it was widely charged, were more to blame than any others. Charges of presidential guilt have always been conditioned on the degree to which Mr. Nixon may have known about or cooperated with men like former Attorney General John Mitchell and former Commerce Secretary Maurice Stans in their, quote, unquote, crimes. Well, after a long and heated and belabored trial, it turns out that a jury in New York feels that neither Mitchell or Stans did commit those crimes. They were not guilty of nine charges of criminal conspiracy. They were not guilty of lying to a federal grand jury in connection with a secret $200,000 cash contribution to the president's 1972 campaign. With that court decision, the bottom literally dropped out of the case against President Nixon. How on earth could the president possibly be guilty of some criminal cover-up of a crime if a court feels that a crime was not in fact committed? Granted, the acquittal of Mitchell and Stans yesterday does not completely absolve Mr. Nixon. There remains hanging the questions of H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman and others whether they tried to cover up the story of Watergate itself, and if they did, whether their actions in turn were done with the knowledge and blessing of the president. But remember, even if they are found guilty of criminal conduct, there must be further evidence, evidence beyond reasonable doubt, that there was knowledge and blessing from Mr. Nixon before the guilt can be assessed to him. Nothing short of that could, in the wildest stretches of the imagination, possibly satisfy the constitutional requirements for impeachment, and if public opinion has any influence on the jurors in the impeachment procedure, and you can bet public opinion will have a tremendous influence since those jurors are all politicians, members of Congress, well, the verdict yesterday in the Stans Mitchell case is likely to have a considerable impact. It demonstrated clearly that at least a few charges of corruption within the highest levels of the Nixon administration in recent years were unfounded charges, and the public is bound to wonder, if Stans and Mitchell were accused falsely, isn't it just within the realm of possibility that President Nixon has himself been the victim of equally false accusations? That verdict in this respect is probably the first really good news that Mr. Nixon has had since the Watergate era started a long 15 months ago. These are the events that shaped the past few days. The events of the next 24 hours are likely to go a long way towards shaping the political destiny of Richard Nixon as a person, and with him, of course, the political destiny of our entire nation. They will be hours of great historical significance, great historical importance. Another key point in the Stans Mitchell trial was noted today by the foreman of the jury that acquitted the two former cabinet officers. She said that she and her fellow jurors doubted the truthfulness of one of the major prosecution witnesses, former White House counsel John W. Dean III. Dean's credibility came in doubt, she said, when he admitted that he had pleaded guilty to a charge of obstruction of justice in the Watergate scandal, pleaded guilty in hopes of drawing a lighter sentence. 
Here in the nation's capital, Vice President Gerald Ford had some comments of his declaring that the jury's verdict in the Mitchell Stans case, in the vice president's words, says to me that John Dean's credibility has been severely eroded. It is John Dean, of course, who was the key witness against President Nixon. Indeed, when you get right down to it, he was the only witness who actually tried to implicate the president in any criminal wrongdoing at the Senate Watergate hearings. It is the same John W. Dean III who was slated to be a key prosecution witness in other cases which are still pending against other former high-level Nixon administration officials who have been accused of involvement in the Watergate scandal. You remove this John W. Dean III from the prosecution case, and that apparently is what the jury in the Mitchell Stans case did, and all of a sudden you have a large sailboat with no wind in its sails. It's not going to go very far. Dean's credibility, rather his lack of credibility, was precisely what the Nixon forces hoped to establish, and apparently they have achieved that number one objective. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here.